Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, I'm really delighted this morning uh, to welcome uh, my colleague and my friend, Ryan Haas, Senior Fellow and Michael Armacost Chair in Foreign Policy at uh, Brookings Institution. Um, we're here today to discuss Ryan's fantastic new book, uh, Stronger, Adapting America's China Strategy in an Age of competitive interdependence. I think those of us who are watching the evolution of the bilateral relationship have long turned to Ryan's steady analytical hand to make sense of what's occurring. I think to objectively look at this from, from both sides and try and chart a, a better path forward here for these two uh, great powers as they try to navigate a, a mounting number of challenges and opportunities in the 21st century. Um, Folks, I'm sure know that before joining Brookings, Ryan had an illustrious career in the US government, including time as a foreign service officer at the US embassy in Beijing, and then later as the director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council between 2013 and, and 2017. Those who've had a chance to read the book will not be surprised by the extraordinarily high quality of the analysis and, and insight contained within the book covers and I think folks will have noticed that this is, again, surprisingly, a very optimistic book, I think, one that should be uh, um, read by Americans who are concerned about the future of this country and who I think have a tendency to underestimate the extraordinary strengths and resiliencies the country has, even as we confront clear, clear domestic challenges. But starting from a position of recognizing these strengths is, I think, the best position to, to have as we look at this China challenge. Um, and there, Ryan not only captures our resiliencies, but also captures many of the challenges that China faces in the coming decades. So um, I'm really, really delighted to dig into all of this today uh, with Ryan. And uh, Mr. Haas, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Jude. I uh, really appreciate the chance to be with you. And more importantly, I appreciate your friendship uh, and camaraderie uh, throughout the book writing process and, and uh, the conversation we're going to have today. Just to clarify, that camaraderie for everyone entailed two emails early on saying you can do it. <laughs> um, so it was not much more than that. But uh, I, I appreciate that, Ryan. Um, Although I did notice, by the way, I'm not sure you recognize this. I think you may have stole my line in your acknowledgments where you say it takes a village to write a book. I'm pretty certain I said that to you first uh, <laughs> in, in an early email. So I feel like some of my IP has been, has been stolen, but nonetheless. Um, I, I wanted to start out, before we really dig into the, the guts of this book and unpack your framework for the relationship going forward, which is this idea of, of competitive interdependence, um, I wanted to take an opportunity to pick your brain um, to get a sense of where we are in the relationship right now. Um, even those who follow this pretty closely, I think, are overwhelmed by the velocity of actions, counteractions that are occurring right now. Obviously, with the Biden administration coming in, we did not get a pause from an increasingly uh, you know, intensifying relationship, even if we certainly got a pause from the um, I, I think the unpredictable news cycles that were occurring within the, within the Trump administration. I wanted to ask you less, how is Biden doing? And I actually wanted to ask you to zoom out a little bit and with your long, um, with, with, with a longer arc, where does the relationship stand right now? And I think if we're looking at this in the arc of sort of the past three or four decades, some have said this is the lowest ebb since Tiananmen Square. Some have said this is the lowest ebb since before the normalization of relations in uh, in 1979 or before Nixon's visit in 1972. Um, how do you view the relationship uh, right now? Well, I, I think that we are in a, uh, in a tenuous position in the relationship, but I don't think we're in a unique uh, position in, in the sense that what we are seeing today is a incremental buildup of pressure in the relationship that has been taking place for a long time. 
Uh, a lot of people recently have talked about the meeting between uh, the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State and their Chinese counterparts in Alaska several weeks ago as a major turning point in the relationship. And I would just say that for those of us who have had the privilege of being in the room for those meetings, what we saw publicly didn't look that unique or dissimilar from what we've heard privately from our Chinese counterparts for a long time. Uh, and it reflects the fact that the relationship is highly competitive and it has been. Uh, both countries believe that their governance system is best in class and best able to deliver results. Both want to benefit from the pull of power through demonstrated success. Uh, both believe that they are entitled to a leadership role on the world stage. And what was unique about Alaska was that all of that bled out into public view uh, as opposed to being held behind closed doors. But what happened after uh, that public airing of grievances also is important because the two sides spent over eight hours together in conversation around every issue that impacts both countries around the world, from climate to Iran to Myanmar, North Korea, you name it. And so you know, that also revealed a, a character of the relationship as well, that we are sort of bound to each other, we're impacted by each other uh, around the world, whether we like each other or not. And so what, what it feels like to me, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this, Jude, is that there has been an accumulation of pressure that has created intensifying competition in the relationship since at least 2008. Uh, I was in the embassy in 2008, 2008 to 2012, and I could begin to feel it then. And, and I haven't seen or felt uh, that pressure abate since then. Uh, and I think that that's sort of where we are. Uh, and the question that we all face is, is it possible for the United States and China to, to coexist amidst this intensifying competition? I remain optimistic that the answer is yes, uh, but that's you know a debated point at the moment. And if you're um, if you're diagnosing continuity versus change now, a few months into the Biden administration, you do hear, I think, especially in in news articles, um, the idea that not um, we're 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 almost in Trump 2.0 seems to be some of the some of the framing. Um, my own personal view is is that. Um, they're similar about a centimeter thick and then things get very differently very quickly. Uh, but I wanted to get your take on this. Um, what's different and what's the same, you know, as of April 6th into a new administration compared to 2016 to 2020? Yeah, well, I think it's worth bearing in mind that we're what, 75, 76 days into the new administration. So they deserve the benefit of a little bit of time before people start uh, casting judgments in stone about their uh, approach to the relationship. Uh, they are still getting, the Biden administration is still getting its team in place. Uh, important figures that will have custody over the relationship are not in office yet. And so um, there probably is more continuity and the overall tone and tenor than some people were hoping for. But uh, there have been changes. They've been somewhat subtle, but I think they've been significant. Uh, there is no longer talk about trying to separate the Chinese Communist Party from the Chinese people. Uh, you don't hear much discussion about, uh, you know, massive whole scale economic decoupling. Um, <clears throat> the president talks about uh, stiff competition or extreme competition with China uh, and makes a distinction between competition and confrontation, uh, which is significant because a competitor is someone that you try to outpace, whereas a opponent or enemy is someone that you feel the need to harm uh, in order to help yourself. And there has been a recognition by both leaders that it is possible and in some places necessary to cooperate with competitors which is a, you know, an important distinction from where we were uh, four months ago at this time in the relationship. Uh, switching gears a bit, one of the things that impresses me about your work and indeed in the book is, is an ability to put yourself in Be Beijing's shoes um, and, and see the world, uh, you know, as the, as the, uh, the leaders in Zhongnanhai view it. And, and I'm, for folks who haven't read it, Ryan's got a really fantastic piece in uh, the last issue of the China Leadership Monitor, um, looking at Beijing's view of, of the strategic competition. So I wanted to just now go 6,000 miles, I forget if it's west or east, it's 6,000 miles, but uh, go over to Beijing right now. And how is Beijing viewing the relationship? Um, we get two sides when we, when we talk with Beijing. That, um, one is the sort of Davos side where it's win-win, it's about uh, uh, upholding the global order. It's about China as a developing country, um, always seeking opportunities for cooperation. Then you open the pages of a you know, Chosher you know, or, or an or a, uh, inward facing publication and you get 
a somewhat darker view of the world that is much more to me almost Manichaean in the great struggle that, that Xi Jinping is trying to lead the country through. So splitting the difference or, or in your own analytical view, um, what, what are the conversations going on right now in Zhongnanhai about the state of the relationship and where it's headed? Yeah, I, so my, my impression is that uh, the Chinese leadership is coalesced around the three word mantra for explaining what's happening in the relationship. It's America's fault. And, uh, and I'm sorry to say that because I don't think it's very productive and I don't think it's going to lead us in a, in a positive direction, but that's just what I, 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 that's what I feel when I talk to our Chinese counterparts, when I read uh, the Chinese media. Uh, the argument that they put forward is that China's policy has been steady and consistent, that China has deepened its relationships with countries all over the world, and that America stands out uh, as a bit of an exception and an outlier. And the reason why the United States is an outlier from their perspective is one, because the United States is fractured and divided at home and is searching for an external enemy to serve as a cohesive agent for healing some of its domestic divisions. And two, because of the gap in relative power between the United States and China is shrinking, the United States is becoming more insecure and reactive and anxious uh, about China's rise. And that these, uh, these sort of twin, twin events are, are pushing uh, the United States in a, a more sharp or hostile direction towards, uh, towards China. And uh, you know, they see the deterioration relations more as a product of China's success and America's insecurities than they do as a result of any change in their own behavior. But Which is dude, you, you and I are in these conversations together often. So, I mean, does that gel with what you hear or how do you think about these things? Certainly, I think the, the diagnosis of it's America's fault um, is a consensus. And indeed, we don't have to scratch that deep to get that. Indeed, if we look at early you know, speeches by folks like Wang Yi, uh, you know, some comments by Ambassador Tsui, Yang Jiechi, it was pretty clear the, the, the message, confusingly to me, being delivered early on was you, you, you broke it, um, which I agree um, is, is, uh, is problematic. The, the second thing is, and I, this is now, I think, become so much of a consensus here in the United States, it's verging on cliche, is that um, China, is, you know, the, the East is rising, the West is, the West is declining, um, which nary a day goes by without some commentator now uh, referring to. And indeed, I will sneak peek here that we have a piece coming out on this as well. So I'm, I'm only the latest to pile onto this cliche. Um, but what worries me about this is, I think there are elements of truth in Beijing's diagnosis of what led to the deterioration of the relationship, including, as, as I wanted to segue to your book in a minute, um, a, a concern about anxiousness in the United States and, and searching for external enemies, enemies, which is not a unique phenomenon in the United States, even if there is oftentimes a, a core kernel of truth about where the US concerns are. Um, what worries me in Beijing is uh, this, this narrative is taking hold at precisely the same time that we're seeing a pretty extraordinary shrinking of the public square in Beijing and the consolidation, continual consolidation of, of power under the Xi administration, where I think there are, are um, significant concerns about one of the abilities that Beijing seemed to have for much of the reform and opening period, which is the ability to adjust when a certain course of action was, was, not, uh, was not working. Um, and as I think we'll discuss later on in the, in the program, we've seen a spate of actions from Beijing over the past few weeks, which seem to give it marginal strategic benefit, but come at the come with some pretty significant soft power cost. And one has to wonder, um, are, are assessments of the damage making their way to the big guy? Um, and is he, um, how is he processing these? And I think from what I've heard um, is that from folks who have interactions with senior leadership in Beijing, um, the information environment is getting pretty constricted there. And if we just think about how bureaucratic processes work anywhere where you have an outsized overpowered leader, it, it's a rare character who feels comfortable knocking on the leader's door and telling them that the, that the course of action the leader has chosen um, is, is leading to, uh, to a cliff. And so I think that's, um, that's what worries me now is, is China's ability to assess um, the return of resilience in the United States accurate. And I think, final point here, this is not about Jude, but I think 
remember where we are, we're on, on January 6th or 7th, when we were talking about, even here in the United States, a really a broken country. Um, we were in the depths of, of COVID-19. There was no, we hadn't seen any of the, of the big progress on vaccinations. We didn't know what growth was going to be like for 2021. And China had just, in principle, signed the CAI. It had gotten RCEP. It had, you know, grown at two plus percent. And there were projections that it was going to grow at seven or eight percent. And now look where we are in April. I think we've seen the United States make a, a really significant uh, recovery here. And so is Beijing hearing that? And is that going to modulate the the East is rising, West is declining um, narrative? I certainly hope so. I've I've seen a few hopeful signs. Uh, Shri and Hong, for example, I think wrote a piece recently talking about the need for the United for China to reevaluate some of its assumptions about uh, China's America's decline. Um, and you know, I hope that that is just a foretaste of a discussion that will take deeper root uh, in Beijing. But I agree with you. I, I worry about what I, I consider sort of bureaucratic constipation, where it's just very difficult for tough information to reach the top um, for all the reasons that you described. And I, I think that, uh, you know, an honest assessment of China would conclude that uh, the formula that they used for 40 plus years that enabled tremendous historic growth uh, is not the formula that they're following anymore. You know, the formula that they had relied upon a stable relationship with the United States, a benign periphery, uh, and avoidance of sort of assuming undue burdens on the world stage, uh, and steady reform and opening of their economy and society. And I think that you could argue on all four of those levels, uh, China is off course at the moment. And it's concerning to me, but it also is concerning for what it tells I think us about what China's judgments are about the US-China relationship. Because I think that they are reaching a point if they haven't already, where they're judging that uh, it's not, that, that Beijing can no longer expect or rely upon a generally stable relationship with the United States. Uh, that therefore the goal of China's policy and approach is not to lower tensions with the United States, it's to gird itself and strengthen itself uh, for the competition that's coming. And I think that we've seen this, for example, with the discussion about dual circulation, changing China's economic model to focus more on uh, domestic demand and, uh, and indigenous innovation and less upon uh, reliance upon the outside world. I think we've also seen it in some of the mirroring activity in dip the diplomatic space in, in recent weeks and months. Uh, you know, it, I don't think it was lost on many that Secretary Blinken traveled to Brussels after Alaska at the same time, Foreign Minister Wang Yi hosted uh, his Russian counterpart and then traveled to uh, you know, the, the aggrieved countries in the Middle East uh, towards the United States. So both countries are sort of in a process of finding their friends to fortify themselves uh, for, for the competition that's to come. And I, I expect that, uh, that, that sort of the stiff competition will be a definitional feature of the relationship for, for the foreseeable future. Which is an incredibly artful transition, um, Ryan, to to talk about to talk about the book because that is one of your defining diagnoses of the relationship. And indeed, if we just look at your your framework, which is competitive interdependence, um, as opposed to what we're seeing now, strategic competition, um, uh, you share a diagnosis that uh, competition will be a defining feature moving forward. But you shift around. Where the competition sits in the in the in the framework. So maybe I could use that as, as, as an opening question for the book is um, what is competitive interdependence as opposed to strategic competition or great power competition or any of the other you know innumerable uh, framings, new cold war uh, that, that we're seeing right now? What what's the difference and why is this why is this a better approach? Well, uh, the difference is that uh, competitive interdependence is trying to capture two thoughts simultaneously. Uh, one, that the relationship is just fundamentally competitive. That uh, you know we have different governance systems, uh, we have competing ambitions, we have different and I would argue irreconcilable interests in certain areas, such as the balance between individual liberties and social stability, the role of the state in the economy, uh, the distribution of power in the international system, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Tibet. So the, there is just a, a intense competition that I think is baked into the relationship. But at the same time, uh, there is an interdependence that I think is inescapable. 
uh, the United States and China are going to be affected by each other for good or ill uh, uh, in pretty much every issue that confronts them around the world. Um, we have economies that are deeply integrated with each other, uh, $700 billion of two-way trade every year. I think something like $400 billion of, of sales by American firms operating in China, selling into the Chinese market. Knowledge production between uh, both countries is deeply integrated. Uh, and on pretty much every global challenge that we confront, uh, it's very difficult to find a path uh, towards progress unless both the United States and China are pulling in a similar direction, whether it's the global economy, uh, building global public health infrastructure, climate change, uh, Iran, North Korea, you name it. And so uh, even, even if we don't necessarily like each other, we're sort of bound uh, to each other. Uh, we will each be a partner or a problem or some combination thereof in, in many of the issues that we both confront. And so that's the, the basic idea of competitive interdependence. Where I think it differs or, or departs a bit from some of the other uh, taglines that you described, whether it's strategic competition or great power competition or new Cold War, is that it's intended to be a bit broader in scope to to sort of embrace the idea that the relationship is not monochromatic. Uh, we, we don't have the luxury of being able to view the relationship singularly as uh, purely competitive uh, because of, of the interdependence that we face with each other. I wanted to ask you where you saw the demarcation between competition and rivalry, because when I think about the, the first groupings of tensions that exist in the bilateral relationship, whether that's over governance systems, economic models, I can imagine a parallel uh, book event going on right now where someone has the same uh, essential diagnosis of the number of fissures in the relationship and has a different framework, which uh, is something more like rivalrous interdependence. Um, and I want to know where for you the demarcation was between a competition and rivalry. And I think as an adjunct question to that, um, I don't know, there are many types of competition. Many competitions are zero sum. There is one winner and there is one loser. Um, so I'm curious for you, why the word competition, what sort of competition are you, you envisioning here as you imagine this? Um, because it sounds like you don't mean a, there is one winner and there's one loser and whoever gets to the finish line first takes all the spoils. Yeah, I think that's right, Jude. I mean, one of the, the things that I've sort of been thinking about is that it's going to be very hard for either country to impose its will on the other. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for either country to accept a subordinate role to the other, given their national identities. And so um, it's the, the, I think that we are in a long-term systems competition with China. We both believe that we have the best governance and economic models to deliver the best results for unlocking the potential of our people and reaching our national ambitions. Um, and we're not going to know the outcome of this competition for a long time. Um, but I think over time, we'll be able to begin to get a clue uh, as to which way it's going. Uh, both countries want to, you know, they want their systems to be demonstrable as successful uh, because they want to enjoy the pull of power in the international system, the, the prestige that comes with that success. And so that's, that's sort of how I've been thinking about uh, the competition. I don't have a great answer. I'm going to think further about where the demarcation is between competition and rivalry. Um, I guess I've been thinking more along the lines of the demarcation between viewing China as a competitor versus viewing them as an enemy or an opponent. Um, because if, if we tip into viewing China as an implacable foe, uh, it's going to cause us to concentrate a lot of our national focus and attention on seeking to blunt and obstruct China. Uh, and, you know, those aren't cost-free shots. Uh, they will incur second and third order effects that will blow back on the United States. Uh, China will respond in kind. We will create separation from our friends and allies uh, who will be less comfortable uh, going down a sort of uh, purely rivalrous or adversarial uh, track with China. And what, what I would like to see us do is uh, shrink the gap between us and our, our allies and partners rather than widen it. Because the more that we're, we're able to work in common cause with others, I think the more influence we're going to have uh, over how China you know, defines and pursues its interests. So maybe, maybe implicit in, in what I've been thinking about is that uh, the, this framework brings us a little bit closer to, to some of our friends and partners and creates a little more permission space for them to work alongside us on China. I want to 
uh, just drill down for a moment on um, and, uh, what competitive interdependence looks like in practice, given the current leadership coterie who is in Beijing and is likely to be there for the next 733 years, um, namely the Xi Jinping administration. Um, as I was reading the book and I was thinking about the power of the, the framing that you've put forward here, and, and I was nodding my head of that makes sense, that makes sense. Where I found myself straying in my thoughts is mapping that over um, the, the current leadership in Beijing and, and to ask a concrete question of what competitive interdependence would look like now or her, how practicable it would look now. We've seen an element of a competitive interdependence or, or, or coexistence model by the Biden administration. They've been saying, in a sense, we're happy to compete on, or excuse me, to cooperate on issues like uh, climate change, but we're not going to give up our focus on values. And Beijing seems to be signaling um, an issue like Xinjiang or Hong Kong is of such core, core national security interest to us. Um, that it is going to essentially, that's going to be fungible and that's going to affect um, many parts of the relationship beyond just a narrow bucket of Xinjiang or, or Hong Kong. So in, in a, you know, using the cliche, uh, you know, China gets a vote in, in, in the framework too. Can you talk about how you see Beijing um, um, accepting or, or integrating with a competitive, uh, excuse me, a competitive interdependence framework given what seemed to be a, a, a hardening of a position on some of these core interests that almost an immovable object meeting an unstoppable force, we're not going to stop talking about Xinjiang and it, that's going to make it only more compelling for Beijing to double down on its approach. Yeah, well, I wish that this framework uh, came with a silver bullet solution to many of the challenges that you identified and I'm, I'm going to disappoint you and our audience by not having uh, uh, solutions. Uh, but I do have a couple of thoughts that I will try to use to address your questions. The, the first is, you know, why, why competitive interdependence, right? I, I think that's sort of at the core of, of what you're asking. And I, I think that it, it can be helpful in allowing us to identify what we can influence and what we cannot. Uh, we are not going to decide China's regime type, whether we like it or not. Uh, we are not going to be able to determine the size of China's economy, even if we wish that we could. But uh, we are going to be able to, I think, influence China's choices on important issues to us, the more so uh, if we're able to work alongside our allies and partners on, on common cause. And we are going to be able to strengthen the sources of our competitive advantage towards China. Uh, you know, these are things like our domestic dynamism, uh, our alliance network, our global prestige. China does not control those things, we do. And uh, the more that we're able to sort of concentrate our, our focus on areas where we can nurture our strengths, I think the stronger position we're going to find ourselves to influence China's behavior. And, and so when it comes to, you know, an issue like Xinjiang, um, yes, there is going to be fundamental and irreconcilable differences in views between the United States and China. Um, but there are things that we can do uh, to, to raise the cost to China of continuing on its current course. The, the first is to strengthen the power of our own example, you know, to, to live up to our values. The more that we able to, are able to do that, the more pressure it places upon uh, the Chinese leadership. Uh, the second is we just need to speak out clearly and consistently uh, at all levels, bilaterally, multilaterally, privately, publicly, at the presidential level and every level below it about the strength of our concerns about these issues. And the fact that as long as, as there is a shadow cast over the relationship by events in Xinjiang, it's going to be impossible for the relationship to return to uh, any type of equilibrium that, that Beijing may seek. Um, I think that we also can you know, take measures to um, be attentive to trade in goods that are made with forced labor and exports of items that could enable uh, greater repression in Xin, Xinjiang. Um, but we also, you know, we need to show support and let the Chinese people see us show support for their efforts and their concerns inside China. And it relates to Uyghurs, but it goes beyond that uh, to things like access to educational opportunity, um, to freedom of information, to uh, air quality, water safety. Uh, the more 
the more goodwill the United States enjoys among the Chinese people inside China, the costlier it is for the Chinese leadership to take actions that uh, clearly uh, undermine the U.S.-China relationship. I want to save some a few minutes here. We're, we're getting some questions that are that are coming in, but I wanted to um, somewhat abruptly uh, shift tack here, uh, given the time limitations. I think even those who um, you know have gone out, read the book, and are in full throated agreement may be thinking about uh, what appears to be or is reported to be a real near-term black swan, which could throw everything off balance, which is there seems to be rising chatter um, that Xi Jinping has drastically pulled forward some sort of artificial timeline on using force to reunify uh, Taiwan. And we've seen a series of reports coming out, I think starting last um, starting last fall and, and really into the winter, the end of the end of the Trump administration, you seem to see a rise in reports that both the U.S. was going to preempt a strike in the South China Sea as sort of a, a late term lash out by the Trump administration. And you began hearing this rumor. Uh, um, I, I, I'll show my cards here. Unsubstantiated. But you, this rumor that that Xi Jinping had had decided to throw caution to the wind and to um, escalate a confrontation over Taiwan because he was sensing U.S. weakness or distractedness. Um, I now get this question a lot from folks. Um, you are a, a real bona fide expert in this in a way that I pretend to be one. So I wanted to take advantage of your assessment here and say, what's the point of a competitive interdependence framework when it looks like the United States um, and China may may possibly come to blows over uh, over over Taiwan? How do you assess that? Where do you see China's thinking on this right now, and do you foresee in the imminent future, whether that's two, three years, or as Admiral Davidson said, possibly in the next six years, do you see China launching an invasion uh, to take Taiwan? And it looks like we have, uh, we have momentarily lost Ryan, uh, undoubtedly, because the question I asked was too sensitive. Um, so I'm going to fill in here for Ryan as he as he reconnects and just further extrapolate out on my own thinking uh, on the question. As the listeners could probably tell that uh, I had my own bias here. Um, as I've been thinking through the issue of of how Taiwan fits into Beijing's thinking, of course you're seeing um, undoubtedly uh, an escalation of sable rattling uh, by Beijing in the Taiwan Straits. I also think it's it's important to note that. Undoubtedly, Beijing has an invasion plan. The, the debate is not over whether or not uh, the PLA is preparing to take Taiwan by force. I think the core, um, the, the core focus, though, is not only does Beijing have the military capability, but what are the domestic political calculations uh, for the Xi administration as, as they contemplate this? And this is one of the areas of analysis that I have found absent from this overall discussion of are, are they on, has their timeline been elevated? Which is to say, imagine if you're Xi Jinping right now, um, your grand strategy does not consist merely of this one single um, objective, uh, namely of reunifying with Taiwan. Everything we know about Xi Jinping, including uh, intentions stated at, at uh, high level forum like the 19th Party Congress, in documents like the 14th Five-Year Plan is that China has um, you know, manifest uh, um, ambitions that it has that uh, far at, uh, spread out much farther than Taiwan. So I would imagine that if we were thinking about, um, if we were thinking about Xi's calculation on Taiwan, that it would include, um, hey, Ryan, Ryan is back. So Ryan, I, I promise I have not been still asking the question. I have just been filling in with some of my own analysis on this. So let me, um, I had begun to further show some of my cards by saying what we had been talking about before the event of um, Xi's calculations on Taiwan are, are um, multifaceted and are not just about the military capability or, or temporary distraction by the United States. So just to kick it over to you, as you're hearing these, these or reading these news reports on, on an imminent attack or attack within six years, what is your assessment? Well, I, Jude, first of all, uh, Thank you for, for carrying things forward. My internet appears to have slipped out uh, at a precarious moment. But I, I'm struggling to wrap my head around the idea that, uh, that we have foresight of uh, you know, a specific timeline of China taking action uh, militarily against Taiwan. Um, I, 
did an interview with John Culver last week. John Culver was the former national intelligence officer for Asia and one of the wisest men I know. And his, his view, uh, just to paraphrase his comments, was that uh, an invasion is not the plan. It's not an impossibility, but it's not the plan for China. And I think that sounds about right, uh, because you know China has a couple of objectives when it comes to Taiwan. The first and most immediate is to deter Taiwan independence or permanent separation of Taiwan from the mainland. And then the long-term goal is to compel unification. Uh, but that is a long-term goal. And, and I think that Beijing has good reasons to want to avoid uh, direct conflict. Um, it would probably invite a clash with the United States that would be very difficult to control, both geographically and in terms of escalation. Uh, it would lead to massive capital outflows from China. It would uh, alert uh, China's neighbors to sort of the, the aggressive nature of China in Asia. It would uh, inalterably poison uh, China's image in the world. And it would lead to a massive diverse, diversion of resources and attention uh, from China's efforts to achieve its other national ambitions and its domestic priorities. So it's not surprising to me that the Chinese have settled on an approach of coercion without violence. Uh, this is an approach that tries to put mounting psychological pressure on the people of Taiwan to persuade them to believe that, uh, that their path, their only path to peace, security, and prosperity runs through Beijing, uh, that resistance is futile, that eventually the, that Taiwan will uh, you know, welcome the warm embrace of Beijing. And I, I worry, frankly, that the more that, uh, that U.S. officials, whether on background or on the record, hype the, the threat of an invasion from Taiwan, the more that we you know, are, are doing a bit of a service to Beijing's efforts to increase uh, pressure, psychological pressure on the people of Taiwan, to help them feel like there is a sort of Damocles that's constantly hanging over their head and that there's nothing that they can do about it. So my, my preference and you know, my humble suggestion to our friends in government would be to spend more time talking about and focusing on areas where we can help Taiwan strengthen itself to feel dignity and respect on the world stage, to diversify its trade relationships, to remain at the cutting edge of technological innovation. The more that we can sort of concentrate our attention in those areas, I think that the stronger position Taiwan will find itself to, to chart its own path forward. Well, thanks, Ryan. I think that was a good dose of, of, of common sense. Um, and I hope, going back to one of our earlier conversations about information environments in Beijing, which I think does give pause for the, for the possibility of of uh, miscalculation by Beijing. I, I hope the Xi administration understands that it would be absolutely catastrophic for China, its future, its ambitions, its desire to be a respected global power for its economy. Um, it would be truly, truly a, a Pyrrhic uh, defeat. I, I wouldn't even say victory, it would be a Pyrrhic defeat for, for Beijing and I hope um, I, I hope that message is is getting through. Indeed, I suspect it. I suspect it is, and I think, you know, Beijing, long a student of great power decline, I hope understands that um, uh, first day victory is one thing, um, attempting to be an occupying power uh, is another, um, and I and I hope that's what is giving Beijing significant significant pause to the point of this not being a, a realistic option. And, and indeed, what you say, which is precisely why. The, camp the, the psychological campaign is so intense, as well as the saber rattle. Um, final thought yeah. here is I, I suspect some amount of Beijing's view of its own military credibility rests on saber rattle. Um, and that for Beijing, this is where it demonstrates resolve that it feels is fungible to other areas around the world, which, which puts it in this bind of needing to saber rattle precisely so it can um, project uh, credibility to the United States in, in other areas. But this is where um, we've lost our old criminology uh, reflex, which was our, our ability, like John Culver, to, I think, really understand um, how Beijing is making assessments, um, where it is, um, uh, and what its intentions are. And I think we've lost a little bit of that muscle. Um, Ryan, I want to use, I just want to use the, the past few minutes to get through just a few questions, if, if you'll permit me that coming in. Um, one of them is on the question of working with allies. This, of course, has been, a, a, this along with we need a strategy on China have been the two bumper stickers I see on most uh, Volvos around, around town. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, the, the Trump administration, especially late in the Trump administration, was making 
I think some some significant progress here after it it um, it holstered its weapon and stopped pointing it at at, at allies and partners. But um, obviously, it showed that there were some limitations to working with allies and partners. We don't have completely overlapping objectives and interests. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how does the United States plan, or how should it uh, plan to approach uh, working with allies when we, we can't expect 100% alignment? Yeah, it's it, that's exactly the right question. And, and I will offer a perspective on that. But before I do, I just wanted to reinforce the points uh, that, that you brought out in your comments about Taiwan. I certainly don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we can afford to be passive or sanguine about the risk that Taiwan faces. Uh, I think that we need to be very robust in our defense and our deterrence um, and, and take the threat seriously. Um, but we, I, I think that the security dimension is just one element uh, of the support that we ought to be providing to Taiwan. Uh, on the question about allies, um, you know, it's going to be slow. Uh, it's slower than we want. It's going to require patience, and we're going to have to be opportunistic about finding areas and opportunities to collaborate uh, with allies. I think we saw a good example uh, last month when President Biden hosted the first ever leaders meeting of the Quad. Um, where the leaders of you know, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States came together to announce a major initiative on vaccine distribution in Asia. Uh, this wasn't directly aimed uh, at China, uh, but it certainly signaled that, uh, that democratic countries are not going to cede uh, the space in Asia around uh, COVID response to China. Uh, and if it leads to a race to the top dynamic where China tries to outcompete uh, the United States and other allies by contributing more uh, vaccines to the rest of the region, then great, then the world will be a better place for it. Um, but that's just an example of, of the types of uh, cooperation I'm thinking about. W I think that we need to sort of approach this question from the principle of meeting our allies where they are rather than where we want them to be, uh, and then building from there. And each of our allies are in different places when it comes to China. But I think that they all share a pretty common attribute of wanting to push China to forego bullying, both at home and abroad, and wanting China to contribute more in a constructive manner to addressing some of the global challenges we all confront. So I think that that provides a, a pretty solid platform for us to build on. And uh, I hope that we use opportunities around the G7 uh, and, and other venues to try to see if we can get some proof of concept uh, to demonstrate that it is possible for us and our allies to work together on China. Um, a question just came in um, asking about the, the possibility of um, strategic mistakes in the relationship. And again, I think this, this builds on our, some of our previous comments on information environments in Beijing. If we imagine, let's imagine after the 20th Party Congress next fall, Xi Jinping will have clearly reached escape velocity um, and will have a, just a, a, if he doesn't already, an absolutely dominant position. But the, the downside of that is um, we can imagine sort of um, more room for unilateral, unilateral decisions by, by Xi. Um, so we've often seen strategic miscalculations or strategic mistakes um, can, can have pretty significant knock-on effects. And indeed, I think one of the concerns right now would be, especially that we have a lot of tonnage out in the South China Sea and things are getting sporty there, even if there are, um, uh, if both Beijing and the United States see a long-term path for trying to get to something like a competitive interdependence framework. Um, how do you think about the possibility of either just a miscalculation, um, kind of high on its own, you know, uh, East is rising supply, or because we see a, a more near term, um, you know, unintended or, or mistake with a, a collision of two visil, you know, vessels in the South China Sea. Um, so how do we bracket, how do we contain those given that those are, are uh, many historical antecedents of that and a, and a real practice possibility here. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important question, Jude, uh, and I'm glad it was raised. I, I think that there are a couple of potential flashpoints of conflict. Uh, one is if China were to take any actions that um, implicated the credibility of our alliance commitments or commitments to security partners, we would have a real problem. Uh, if China were to seek to impede America's access in the region, we will have a real problem. Uh, there's also the risk of, uh, you know, as you said, unintended collisions uh, that lead to rapid escalation. And there's risk around 
um, some of these new and emerging technologies uh, where the pace of innovation is, is exceeding the, the rules and norms that are being built around these technologies. And so <clears throat> what I would like to see us do is, uh, you know, draw from some of the lessons of the Cold War uh, and apply them to this moment. Uh, we know where the risks are. And uh, we know that we are significantly far behind uh, where the United States and Soviet Union were in terms of their risk reduction uh, and crisis management protocols uh, during the Cold War. Now, it isn't going to be a one-to-one -one, uh, facsimile. The, the relationship is different and, and the challenges are different. The geography is different. Um, but we, we need to prioritize uh, risk reduction in the relationship. Uh, we're just behind schedule on this. And the only way that it's going to make progress is if both leaders instruct their bureaucracies to make it happen and use their meetings as action forcing events to push and prod uh, uh, both of their systems to, to reach agreements. Because left to their own devices, uh, you know, both country security services are going to be pretty reluctant and reticent to cede uh, uh, use of certain capabilities that they think could benefit them uh, in, in conflict with the other. I know we're at time. I just wanted to sneak in one, one final question. And I want to thank everyone. We've, we've got some really thoughtful questions that have come through and I, and I apologize that we can't get to all of them, but I'll, I'll make sure I'll forward all of these um, on to Ryan just so he can see what, what folks are, are interested in. Um, um, but one of the final ones is actually getting back to this competitive analogy here. Um, one of the strategies that was clearly operative in the Trump administration was thinking about a race, but focusing on tripping up China slowing China down, obviously, which is appears to be cheaper than, uh, you know, me going to the gym and, and learning how to run faster. Um, but one of the questions here is about um, where should we think about tripping China up? Even if we imagine that we're having a, a strategy based on increasing our own domestic resiliency, and we take that out of, as a given, that's that's a, um, do we also need a, a defensive strategy here that in the, in the words of this question are about gumming up the works of some elements of China's uh, ability to, to compete in us in areas where we do see it as more zero sum. So can you talk for a minute about wh where does tripping actually have a role if it does at all in thinking about our strategy on China? Yeah, well, I, as, as you alluded to, I prefer the balance of our efforts to be on us running faster rather than seeking to trip China, um, because I think that we are in a stronger place if if we are on offense and the Chinese are reacting to us rather than us anxiously reacting to to every advance that they make. But there is a certainly there is a place for defense. Uh, I've learned a lot from your colleague Scott Kennedy and and Jim Lewis on this. They've they've written a lot and are very thoughtful uh, on these questions. So I would certainly encourage uh, anyone in our audience to take a look at their work. But around export controls, around leakage of sensitive technology uh, that has dual use applications. Uh, we need to have a national conversation about where, where that sweet spot is around what we can comfortably export to China and, and where we need to set some boundaries to limit uh, the export of items to China. And there are certain tech, uh, choke point technologies around lithography and, and in other areas where I think that we need to think deeply about, um, about limits that should and could be applied uh, to exports to China. It's to our advantage to, to stay ahead of the Chinese and a lot of these technologies, and, and we need to make sure that our policies enable and support us in doing so. And part of that is the defensive element, and part of it is understanding also that, uh, you know, a lot of these companies' revenues are aided by trade with China which is funneled into research and development, which allows us to continue to maintain the edge uh, innovatively over China. So uh, that's a, a muddled <laughs> response to a very clear question, um, but uh, that's the best I've got at the moment. Well, the, the, the best you've got at the moment is, is, is fantastic, Ryan. And I wanna um, thank you, including for the ability to seamlessly switch camera angles um, and and uh, go from steady cam to, uh, to to mobile cam. Um, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. We we really had some great questions, um, and I wish we had five hours with uh, with Ryan. But again, I'm going to hold it up. The book is uh, stronger. Uh, just out from Yale University Press. As you can see from my well tabbed and dog-eared copy, um, there's just a lot in here for pushing thinking on 
how the United States can um, reapproach its relationship uh, to China, one from a position of, of confidence rather than anxiety. Um, and I, I just really think uh, Ryan's steady hand um, in, in the community of, of folks advising, uh, advising the US on, on what we should do. So Ryan, thank you very much and appreciate your time. Thank you, Jared, I appreciate it. Great, thanks everyone. Thank you.